Hello, everyone. I'm Nikai Paredes, the Programs Director of the Academy of American Poets. Welcome. For those of you who don't know us, the Academy of American Poets produces Poets.org, which is the world's largest publicly funded website for poets and poetry. We established and organized National Poetry Month each April. We publish the Poem A Day series in American Poets Magazine, and we also provide free resources to K-12 educators, including the award-winning Teach This Poem series. You can visit poets.org to learn more. It's my honor this evening to welcome you all to our annual Blaney Lecture. This lecture series was created in memory of Dr. Dorothy Gulbenkian Blaney, a noted educator who served on the Academy Board by a gift from her estate. We're grateful to her daughter, Hope Harrison, for her support. ASL interpretation this evening is provided by Pro Bono ASL. I'd like to thank Christina Monson and Bernice Williams for joining us tonight. This evening's lecture will be delivered by Academy Chancellor Patricia Smith and is titled, The Scrawny Little Black Girl with the Hasty Pigtails Sounds Out Anemone. Patricia Smith is a poet, teacher, and performance artist. She is the author of several award-winning poetry collections, including most recently, Unshuttered, which was published last month by Northwestern University Press. She's also the author of Incendiary Art, winner of the 2018 Kingsley Tufts Poetry Award and the 2017 Los Angeles Book Award in Poetry. Also the author of Shoulda Been Jimmy Savannah from Coffee House Press, winner of the Academy's Lenore Marshall Poetry Prize and Blood Dazzler, which was a finalist for the 2008 National Book Award. Smith is a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. She is also a Kave Khanum faculty member and a professor of creative writing at the City University of New York, College of Staten Island, and Princeton University. In February 2023, Smith served as a guest editor of the Poem A Day series. And in January 2023, she was elected to become a chancellor of the Academy of American Poets. She lives in New Jersey. Before I pass the mic to Patricia, I'd like to remind everyone joining us live that this lecture will be followed by a brief Q&A session. And you can actually watch a replay of this lecture right after um, we uh, end our live broadcast. You can also submit a question for a Q&A session by clicking on the question mark icon found to the right side of the chat box on Crowdcast. If you don't have a question, we invite you to view other audience members' questions and vote for them. Voting for a question moves it higher up in the list. And finally, the chat will be open throughout this evening's program. And I thank everyone joining us here for being respectful to your fellow audience members in the chat. And now, please welcome Patricia Smith. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank everyone. This is utterly fantastic. It's amazing. I was looking at the chat and there were people from Nigeria and people from Germany and people from the UK. And I sound really old every once in a while. I was uh, about to say, you know, this computer thingy is really going to gonna stick, you know? Um, anyway, I'm very, very happy um, to be here. I want to thank the Academy. This is an extraordinary opportunity. And even more, uh, I want to thank all of you gorgeous, faceless entities out there, you know, for taking time out of your lives to look and to listen to little old me. Um, if you haven't heard or seen my uh, new book, Unshuttered, if you haven't heard about it, I'll need to tell you just enough. It's a volume of dramatic monologues or persona poems accompanied by 19th century photos of Black Americans. Uh, for more than 20 years, I've been gathering images from the 1840s through the 1890s. The gathering began as unrelenting curiosity. You know how poets are about the stories and faces. And I loved 
the sweet cacophony of all those silences babbling at once. After I realized how seldom I came upon them, I began to concentrate on images of Black folks. A few 19th century Blacks were well to do enough to arrange to sit for their own portraits. Some only faced the camera because some white man who fancied himself a master had decided to catalog his property. His carriage drivers and his field hands, his house servants and his wet nurses, his dishwashers and his cooks, his human souvenirs. But what could the pictures ever be besides two-dimensional curiosities? As a faculty member for Conve Conum, the extraordinary retreat for African-American writers, I used the images as writing prompts. I gave each writer a picture and said, tell me what these people tell you. And they did. Oh my God, they did. Their success is where the seed from Unshuttered took hold. It is difficult to describe how I felt about the pictures that I collected and how I continued to forge a link with them that I didn't particularly understand. It's difficult to describe all the hours I spent searching faces, looking into eyes, marveling at the freckled cream, the blue blackness, examining those noses and straight set mouths. It's difficult to explain why I gave the people in the pictures names. I spoke aloud to them. I felt that I knew them. And sometimes I felt that I heard them. I know that the subjects in the pictures were not in any case known by what I called them. I know that they lived their own lives, buckled under their own burdens, and laughed with their own heads thrown back. They managed to move through their days blissfully unaware of a restless poet thousands of tomorrows away who needed with her whole self to know them. Of course, this question has been asked before and no one has found an answer that fits. So I'll ask again, where does it begin? The idea that our voice is the human voice that all life is every life, that there are no boundaries whatsoever when it comes to exploring who we are. My answer starts, or, or doesn't start, with a brown, hard-sided valise held tough with brass rivets, the same indestructible suitcase now in the back of so many closets, the one that hopeful travelers crammed with all their treasures and lugged during their sojourns from South to North, from Muscle Shoals to Detroit, from Greenwood to Philly, from Natchez to New York, or in my mother's case, from Aliceville, Alabama to the west side of Chicago. The suitcase had always been somewhat of a mystery, a sweet, sweet promise. Inside, my mother declared, were all of our photos. I imagined that included my baby pictures and curled corner Polaroid snaps of my daddy flashing his grin and mad styling in a shark skin suit. All my class pictures where I was always gangly and weird in the back row. Maybe pictures of my mother as a young girl, her eyes tomboy wild, her front teeth not yet ruined by a snapped on gold. But most important, I wanted to see those pictures of people with faces that looked vaguely or just like mine, lost to go relatives my mother refused to talk about. You see, she was ashamed of coming from down south, that nasty old place, which she considered dirt poor and backwards that place where folks couldn't help their ignorant double negatives, that place where tired crops struggled through red dirt, that place of little lopsided houses, the fat cheapest cuts of meat and white folks owning all the sidewalks. When I asked her about the Alabama where she was born and grew up in an effort to piece together some of my own backdrop, maybe draw out a little joy, she ridiculed my curiosity. Girl, what you need to know about that old down south stuff for? 
You ain't from there and don't nobody tell you you are either. That's why I born you up here in this city so you can get somewhere and be somebody. We Chicago folks. You got a Chicago mama and a Chicago daddy and a dress right here on the West side. You ain't got to know but one thing about Alabama and that is that I left it. This was just one of the ways that my mother effectively held my history captive by hiding her own. I've been thinking a lot about history being taken away, about the now everyday act of disappearing the past. I'm sure that we all have in the midst of this fevered movement to unteach black history and move all our yesterdays farther away from us and our most troubling yesterdays far from everybody else to bombard us with falsehoods until someone and then another someone and another one begins to believe that they could be true. Somebody or something can make you look behind yourself and see nothing, see no road at all you walk to get to where you are. Sometimes it's a government counting over you, averting its eyes, denying your face. Or it could be a history book telling you that Rosa Parks was just a mildly inconvenienced lady on a bus. How much fun it was for Black folks to play with fire hoses and German shepherds and how the unfortunate mistake of lynched men nevertheless made trees intriguing. But sometimes lies are tangled with love. I think that when I was little, and my mother reached over during an episode of I Love Lucy or Bonanza or My Three Sons and wordlessly pinched my nostrils shut and held on until the credits rolled. It was because of my wide damn nose and because she loved me. I think that every summer when I come in from playing all glossy and blue black, she scrubbed the back of my neck with undiluted Lysol because, damn it, child, didn't I tell you to stay out of that sun? And because she loved me. I think that when she took tied laundry detergent and shook it into my bath water, ignoring the screams as the slow burn took hold between my legs, that she prayed it would turn me lighter. And that was because she loved me. I think that when she turned the fire up under that hot comb, that big iron comb, and then dragged it through my disobeying tufts of hair until I heard and smelled the charring, that she wanted that silk for me. And she loved me. I think that when she slammed the door shut with the whole state of Alabama on the other side, she wanted all that lesser all that inconvenience, all those reminders of that nasty old place to be gone. The bad grammar, the, bad, the bare feet, the slow twang, food that needed to be plucked of hair before you could eat it, just all that damn stupid and backwoods. She wanted her daughter to be something else. She was raising a Chicago girl. And I fought her the best I could, wrestling to find and hold on to everything she didn't want me to see or have. I hoped the contents of the elusive suitcase would help. She had finally agreed to open it. Inside, I prayed there were kinfolk with wide noses and full lips, wired stubborn hair and unflappable Alabama attitudes. I assumed that a lot of who I was was really in there. So I snapped open the stiff latches and opened the suitcase, unleashing a stink I can only describe as flat and distant. Here are some of the pictures I found inside. My mother, flaunting silky and satiny church finery in coral and rose and ocean blue and lavender and jade, each outfit accompanied each time by some impossibly angular ski slope of a Baptist hat. My mother, squinting into the sun, alone on vacations that I don't remember her taking. Oddly enough, 
my father's autopsy report with detailed descriptions of everywhere a bullet had broken into his body. My mother on vacations with her church family, vacations I didn't remember her taking. My mother in an explosion of raspberry satin gliding down the runway in a church fashion show. My mother glaring at someone who was not her, someone smaller, gliding down the runway in a church fashion show. My young mother, just before religion took hold of her, trapped in a black dress and perched on a bar stool that barely handled those hips. A yellowing church program for Women's Day with my mother grinning smugly from the lead story. An ancient church program separating along its folds with two strange names underlined. A funeral program. Here my mother interjected, I remember that. They sure put that woman away good. Everybody was there. And Lord, she was dressed. The one professional studio shot that exists of my grandmother. The one professional studio shot that exists of my mother. Four copies. Handfuls of underdeveloped Polaroids of people that my mother hemmed and hawed about and finally admitted or pretended she didn't remember. I, I don't know, Pat. He might be related to you. And dozens of other images in various stages of fade. Photos of houses and cars and storefronts and churches and chitlin assembly lines and greyhound buses and soul food restaurants and baptisms and winking gold teeth in all those elaborate hats and crucifixes behind the pulpit and my mother and my mother and my mother and my mother and my mother. In one photo though, there was a black patent leather Mary Jane shoe blurred on its way out of the frame. I had to assume that the shoe and the little foot inside it was mine. I can even hear my mother's voice. Child, move on over there, out of the way of grown folks, so we can take this picture. And that was it. We emptied one suitcase, then another one, until nothing was left but their fake silk linings, shredded and still stinking of flat and far away. It was the smell of 1960, which, as we all know, was not the best year for Negroes. Seeing my dawning despair and immediately misunderstanding it, my mother marched over to a bureau, pulled open a bottom drawer, and lifted out my framed high school graduation. <laughs> I don't think she realized the significance of that bottom drawer. Yep, there I was. You can have this, she said. I did not look at her. I did not move. I, I, I guess your daddy got the rest of them pictures, she muttered. Here's the problem with that. My father was murdered in a robbery when I was 21. I'm an only child, a daddy's girl, and I grieved whole Bibles. My mother made no move to save his belongings and the city finally cleared out his apartment and everything in it, everything. His snazzy Stetson hats, bottles of spiced cologne, his sun and sugar splattered work shoes, everything. You are probably reaching a terrible conclusion right about now, gradually as I did. My mother did not possess, so I do not possess, a single picture of me taken before my senior year of high school. In fact, that picture was the only one she had. The others, I thought she had them. She thought my father had them. Then the city of Chicago had them. 
so no one had them. No school or class pictures. No snapshots of me blowing out birthday candles. No pictures of screaming my head off at Riverview Amusement Park or jumping double dutch or dancing with rubber bands at Chinese jump rope. No baby pictures or Christmas photos beside that gaudy silver tree. No picture of me in our Sears dinette chair, yelping, neck bent, getting my hair burned for Sunday service. No pictures of me in a poofy Easter dress, clutching a basket of plastic eggs. No pictures with boys, girls, dogs, uncles, cousins, aunts, grandmothers, no images, no visual proof that I was alive when I was alive as I am alive. I remember posing. I remember those big boxy cameras and the actual bulb you had to snap on to take a flash picture. I remember scrunching my eyes at the flash. Well, there is one other picture I own that has survived. It's the image of a four-year-old me on the cover of Life According to Motown, my first book. I am wearing the pink dress my father loved. The dress had a rose on the front held on with a tiny gold safety pin. One of my hands rests on the top of our family's prized possession, a monstrous TV phonograph combo. That thing was the whole living room. We lived on the third floor of a tenement building at 3315 West Washington Boulevard on the west side of Chicago, the part of town everyone warned you to stay away from. In the picture, you can't see the roaches creeping into the folds of the Murphy bed or the mouse crooning blue note beneath the stove. It was my father's favorite picture. My father's nickname for me was Meathead. Meathead. Meathead has no backdrop. Meathead doesn't have many yesterdays you can see. Meathead is missing a history. Now you are probably reaching another gradual realization that this lecture isn't really about poetry. Oh, but it was. Oh, but it is. Oh, but it will be. Meathead, where you at? You done with dinner? Come on in here then. I talk about my father a lot, a lot. You may have heard me spurt love many, many times, and I make nary an apology. Otis Douglas Smith is the first line of every poem and the first line of every story. In every room where I read, I focus on a seemingly empty chair, and that is where he is. You, you ate that cream corn, didn't you? Your mama cooked that. She works hard. You know, don't make your mama mad now. He was, is, was, I mean, a frustrated blues man. He never locked into a key that agreed with him, but he sang nevertheless, loud, reckless, always the wrong lyrics, leaving spittle speckled with lucky strike on the mic. Those of you who are daughters loving your daddies might begin to understand. How about this? He taught me how to drink. He took me to a real bar, smoky and sticky, plopped me up on a bar stool. I think it probably is illegal to tell you how old I was. And he began feeding me plump shots of JB. In between shots, he'd pummel me with utterly annoying questions. Who, who did I just introduce you to? What song? What song is that on the jukebox? When, when you walk out of this door, which way do you turn to get home? What's your address? What's our phone number? What's the name of that place where I work? I didn't pass the test until I could answer all of the questions correctly, even after downing an ungodly amount of rot gut. 
Was that child abuse? Uh, never mind. Okay. Well, nobody will ever be able to take advantage of you, baby girl. That's what he told me once I was no longer hung over or under the weather. Uh, they're going to think. They'll think they're getting you drunk so they can do what they want to do. And you just let them think that. But you're going to always have your head right. You're going to always know how you getting home and the way you need to go to get there. And you know, he was right. Try me. Is it time? Those dishes all done? You make sure that kitchen clean meathead. Your mama worked hard to get dinner on that table. Every evening, my father told me stories. He was perfect first poetry. He was still everything that he had left down south. When he lived with us, the stories came right after our dinner of collards, salt pork, and cornbread, or our dinner of pinto beans and ham and cornbread, or our dinner of cheap steak smothered numb by my mama and cornbread, and oh, and creamed corn, which I hated because it never did not look like snot. Okay, sit down here at my feet, child. I got a good one for you today, baby girl. No storybooks, no legal pads, no notes. Just my gravel-throated Arkansas daddy teaching me that there were other ways to speak the world beside what I was learning or, because we're talking about the Chicago public school system, not learning in school. Every day, he was my blank slate, which, before bedtime, spurted raucous colors, several winding and colliding nail-biter plots and voices that were not his own. Let me tell you who didn't show up to work today, baby girl, and then let you and me guess why. One of my favorite sources of story fodder and his was Leaf Brands, the candy factory, <laughs> the candy factory where both he and my mother worked. The long and always getting longer story was our own private soap opera, a meandering action-packed narrative featuring very real people with very real secrets. Daddy was a big fan of character and he was very good at knowing what no one wanted to see. The story, which we called the falling leaf, get it, leaf brand, falling leaf, okay, had everything cutting corners on the job, gossip blazing through the usually dreary factory line, big, big money in the pockets of little, little folk, and add to that the various oily indiscretions of every kind, including the kind I relished the telling of, but in no way understood. I know it was a damn good story, though, because after harumping loudly to indicate her disapproval, my mother started scraping her chair closer to the door to eavesdrop. Daddy knew how to draw a crowd. Jimmy Lee lived his best days in an Arkansas shack. From the kitchen window, he could see the cross poked up in the dirt out back. At night, his wife, Emma, she talked to him from underneath that cross. Fine when he set out for the sophisticated stories of the big city. But there was a reason I called daddy the griot of the back porch. He was just enough history, just enough down south, just enough twang and bluster to mesmerize me. We didn't have a back porch, at least not the kind that I imagined, but I could definitely see him rocking there, watching the world unwind and swelling with story. Because of the hapless but happy Jimmy Lee, I had someone to giggle and grieve with, Delta Ken, to check in on. I can't be entirely sure that my father didn't know about the hollow that Jimmy Lee filled. He'd heard my mother shut down my questions about her upbringing, and therefore my upbringing, and his stories wallowed in what he remembered. Although he tried to counter her reluctance, my mother was squat, fierce, very much an immovable object. But my daddy and I, our stories were ours. 
at his feet every evening after dinner, I walked into a world that knew me. I learned to laugh with my head thrown back, mouth wide open, nose spread wide. I learned to exclaim and cackle and shed loud tears like a bona fide down south girl. When you hear a story in my poems, you hear Otis Douglas Smith. You hear my daddy. I was 10 when my father decided finally that my mother was too much. She was shrill and jealous and vengeful and suddenly loudly religious. The Lord told her many things personally, most of them meant to squash the life from my father and stop me from being so much of his daughter. The Lord said, no card playing. The Lord said, no jute boxing. The Lord said, be home before the street lights come on. The Lord said, no taking that child anywhere near that tavern. The Lord told her to stop wearing pants and makeup, to devote what was left of her life to service. Meanwhile, daddy's stories, now often delivered in conspiratorial whisper, leaned delightfully toward what little hell I knew. The love triangles at the candy factory were heating up. Jimmy Lee kept getting into decidedly unholy trouble. So my mother and father, who got along like old grease in a red hot skillet, parted ways. I make it sound simple because if I don't, the truth will hit me and knock me even now off my feet. I cried as if my father had died. I cried because he left me alone with two strangers, my mother and the Lord. But daddy came every day after work and stayed while my mother snorted and cursed at under her breath and pointedly did not feed him and hurriedly moved to any room where my father and I were not. My father told me my story I was never not going to get that story and waited until I fell asleep before he left. But I was never really asleep. As soon as it was quiet, after my father had gone and my mother was done ringing up all the church ladies to complain about his no accountantness, I'd pull a much magic thing out from under the covers, a transistor radio. Seafoam green with silver knobs and a tiny antenna. I'd plug one earphone into my ear and listen with the volume turned down as low as possible to all the thin, tinny music I could dial up until I drifted off or didn't. You won't ever understand what music gave me, gives me. I don't even fully understand it even now. Chicago's Black music station, WVON, fell quiet at the end of the evening and was dead air until morning. But WLS kept blasting across the country, and there the stories didn't stop. I am definitely going to age myself now, but I'm going to say it. Back in my day, I promise I would never say that, but here I am. Back in my day, songs didn't lock into a loop drifting into your head until you gave up and danced. Songs were little dramas. I knew how hard the temptations begged for a woman to come home. I knew how they crooned five-part heartbreak. I knew the mountaintop of Smokey's falsetto. I knew James Brown's unleashed sweat and Sam Cooke's brown liquor blues. But I also knew Neil Diamond, the New Colony Six, the Association, the Beatles, the Birds, and all about Scott McKenzie and San Francisco. Remember, if you're going to San Francisco, be sure to wear some flowers in your hair. I'm gonna sing a little bit today, so get ready. Anyway, right now, if you turn on an oldie station, I will bet you good, good money that I can sing from beginning to fade out at least 90% of the songs. 
The songs, they weren't just sounds. I mean, they were snippets of the everyday, real snippets of the everyday. They had beginnings and ends and sensory driven middles, you know, intros, rising action, climax, falling action, and a definite conclusion. And then, hey, fade on out. And they sounded like shattered hope, wrong choices, mindless love, and the lines rhymed. Ladies and gentlemen, I present a small snippet of Mr. William Smokey Robinson. You only filled me with despair by showing love that wasn't there. Just like the desert shows a thirsty man, a green oasis where there's only sand, you lured me into something I should have dodged. The love I saw in you was just a mirage. What? Okay. Oh, yeah. And remember, Remember all those songs in like the 50s and 60s about the dead sweethearts? Remember how um, white girls were always dropping the class ring and they would run back on the train tracks and, you know, they drop it and they run back to get the ring or the car stalled on the tracks and they remembered that the ring was in the car and they'd go back and the train would hit them and the car. And then a guy would be crooning about his dead sweetheart and how he wishes she was alive and he thinks about her. Right. I used to love those things. But did you know that there was like one, like a black version of that? It was so cool. It was called The Beginning of My End. And this is like not even, I hadn't even thought about this. I just thought about this. But and this, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you two little versions of it because I want, I just want you to hear it because this is where I got my poetry from. All right. I was sitting. Okay. So he and his girlfriend had just had a fight. Okay. And she drove off angry. And, and that's, that's the opening. That's what you need to know. So this is where it comes in. I was sitting at home watching my TV when the noise of the phone rudely disturbed me. I wasn't quite sure at first just what the doctor meant when he informed me that there had been an accident. And this is my fright part. Why? Oh, why? I heard her mother cry as I rushed to the scene with tears in my eyes. Somebody asked, somebody asked who was the next of kin. And oh, Lord, it was the beginning of my Okay, cool. Right, okay. Now, now, you think this is still not about poetry? Oh, yes, it is. Now, I am going to go way back, and I'm, I'm sure you're glad that I'm no longer singing, but I'm going to go way back to the fourth grade. I was in yet another school whose students weren't supposed to achieve anything, and my teacher was Mrs. Stein, and all I can remember about her is a brunette flip and white tights and a voice that was just a little wavy on the edges, probably because she was surrounded by black kids in a part of town everybody warned you to stay away from. One day, she wrote a strange word on the board. A-N-E-M-O-N-E. -E. Can anyone pronounce this? She asked. Picture me, always in the front row, my hand thrust in the air, lopsided pigtails, the part crooked because my distracted mother often parted my hair with her forefinger instead of a comb. I was scrawny as all get out. But I remember that day. Must be a trick question, I thought. No way that's Annie Moan. No way. White teachers got tricks. Anemone? Nope, not sneaky enough. I thought about how when my daddy needed a word that didn't exist, he'd crash two words together to make a new one. Or how he pointed out how crazy English could be with its insistence on night, K-N-I-G-H-T, and night, N-I-G-H-T, and love and move, not rhyming, even though they were both O-V-E, and write, W-R-I-T-E, and write, R-I-G-H-T, and write, R-I-T-E. My hand shot up. Anemone, I said. 
Miss Stein heaped me with a little bit too much praise. I heard hissing behind me. Damn, I was going to have to fight on the way home from school again because I thought I was so smart. But that word, I loved the way it moved in my mouth waiting for air. Anemone. Anemone. I loved it in the air. And this was even before I knew what it meant. Here's how I wrote about it much, much later. Miss Stein scribbled a word on the blackboard, said, who can pronounce this? And the word was anemone. And from that moment you first felt the clutter of possible in your mouth, from the time you stumbled through the rhythm and she slow smiled, you suddenly knew you had the right to be explosive, to sling syllables through back doors, to make up your own damn words when you needed them. All that day, sweet anemone tangled in your teeth, spurted sugar tongue, led you to the dictionary where you were assured that it existed, to the cave of the bathroom where it warbled and bounced echo, and finally convinced that you own that teeny gospel. You wrote it again and again and again and again and uh, again and again, and again. Now, this is about poetry. One word sounded slowly and with dawning wonder by a scrawny black girl with hasty pigtails. One word, any word, hurtling its way toward story. One story, then another and another, from the gravel throat of an Arkansas man. That little girl in search of a history, wrapping her life around story, stories wrapping their lives around her. Men and women and children, mute on paper and glass, reach out for the girl, holding what she believes she has lost. They pull the world wide open and she walks inside. Thank you. Thank you so much, Patricia. I guess we can take a breather here in a moment. Um, there's a lot of gratitude in the chat. Uh -huh. Thank yeah. you. Thank you all. Thank you all for being here. Thank you, Academy. Uh, this was a, an absolutely indescribable experience. And I appreciate all of you. Um, well, at this juncture, we have some time for some questions. Um, and uh, for folks tuning in uh, on Crowdcast via browser, you can submit a question. Um, by clicking on the question mark icon to the right of the chat box, which is just going from my perspective here. Um, so thank you all for your enthusiasm. If you don't have a question, we invite you to view other audience members' questions and to vote for them. So I'm going to kick it off, actually, uh, Patricia, with a question that uh, my colleague uh, and our senior content editor, Mary Sutton, has prepared um, while we wait for folks to submit. Um, Mary asks, uh, you call your father the griot of the back porch, which calls to mind images of other bluesmen, particularly Buddy Guy, who is the subject of your poem, Making Love to Buddy Guy. Um, what do you think the blues can teach us and what it has already taught us about how a good poem works? Well, I think that one of the one of the things I'm often talking to my students about is our unexpected entry points to poems. And one of those is searching for the ugly in beauty, um, searching for the beauty in ugly, you know? And uh, what I think, what, I love the blues so much simply because there's so many ways that we want, run away from what hurts us. Uh, we run away from grief. We think grief is something to be gotten past and gotten over. And I think um, as writers, as people, not even just as writers, 
I think we need to discover ways to sit with that grief, uh, ways to make music from it, ways to remember that uh, grief starts and grief, grief is so difficult because the subject of that grieving, the reason you're grieving is something that you loved. And so to get back to that, that moment of love, I think you do have to spend a lot of time with the grief. And it's funny that you mentioned Buddy Guy. Uh, I follow him like crazy. You know, I've gone on blues cruises and, and uh, gone to wherever I've seen that he's been playing. Uh, he is now about to do his final tour and I was trying to figure out some way to take like a year off and just follow him at every every place that he is. Um, the blues to me uh, also represents a lot of what we've forgotten about uh, the wonders of the South, what it meant to be from down South, what it meant to tell a good story that wasn't necessarily a story with a happy ending. Uh, and I, I'm a little, I grieve a little bit about the fact that not many people know a lot about blues or are willing to take that walk back into what the blues uh, represented to know. Uh, that's why I, I uh, appreciate uh, poets like Tayamba Jess, you know, people who are looking back at the music and making new music from it. Uh, but I think that the blues, uh, they call it blues poetry sometimes, but it's not always blues poetry because it's about something bad. It's because that we understand the power in that type of music and how it can take us from good times through bad and have us keep hold of it the whole time and not be scurrying to get past, to live with it, to live in it. Thank you. And thank you, Mary, for that question. Um, if I can ask, I think we can ask a few more. And I am um, looking at the upvoted chats, uh, sorry, upvoted questions in the chat. This is actually a question also from Mary. Um, I'll just read it now. Um, you talk about your mother's attempts to repudiate her Alabama history while your father was, and quote, still everything that he left down south, end quote. Still, your mother's form of whitewashing, which was about trying to protect you from her pain, is different from the state-sanctioned whitewashing happening today. How do you feel about releasing your book, Unshuttered Now, during a moment in which some politicians are trying to restore the silences in which the people in your curated photos were trapped? Sure. Um, the one thing that I, I need to say, uh, about uh, what I had discovered um, my mother had been doing. And, and a lot of this, it was the, the Lysol, the Thai detergent. I found some other people who grew up um, around the same time that I did and they said, oh, me too. You know, So I found out that I wasn't alone. And she did do it because she, was, she thought that the key to surviving in the North was assimilation. Uh, and, and that the, the wider I could be, in both appearance, which was impossible and sound, uh, the more that I would achieve, you know. Um, the thing about my book and, and the, the basis of the lecture was that uh, collecting those photos over the years really um, filled a hollow for me because I, I couldn't really trace my family back the way that I'd always dreamed that I'd be able to do. Uh, and now when they, they're trying not only to keep the history away from whites who they think it may embarrass or hurt or, or make them feel ashamed, but also in the process, and not many people have talked about this, they're keeping the history away also from black children. You know, uh, and so they're saying the less, that, the less that you know about yourself, the weaker that you will be. And I think that might even be a bigger part of it. And so I, I think it's really interesting to, we, we tend to look at these old photos as curiosities and, and tchotchkes and trinkets and, you know, uh, but that what I'm trying to do in the book is show that we lived parallel lives. You know, there were people during that time who were hurt and, and angered and suffering, of course, but there were also people 
who were living full lives. There were people who were gay. There were people who were, you know, I mean, it was just, um, I, I want people to be able to look back and say, I see myself there, you know, because if our history is not going, is no, are, is no longer going to be taught in schools, I mean, I think it will be, but I don't think the attempts to, to uh, make it be otherwise are ever going to stop. So if our history is not gonna be there, we have to find it ourselves. You know, we have to find ourselves. It needs to start with a family saying, uh, this is how far back your family can go. This is what people, how they lived in those times. Here's what it meant to live in the South. Here's what it meant to come North. Uh, I remember talking to my students and say, how many of you talked to your grandparents? And they're like, well, she cooks, you know? I mean, nobody sits down and says, you know, uh, hey, grandma, what was it like to be in love? How did you meet my grandfather? What dances did you do? What, you know, and tell me about your grandparents. You know, and, and I think um, our histories are our responsibility. You know, we don't hand them over to other people to give to us, but if they're our responsibility, then we have to relearn our own lives. Thank you so much for that answer. Um, I'm looking at the time and I'm looking at the beautiful questions um, in the question box. I'm gonna do something a little bit different, Patricia. I'm gonna read the top three questions that people have voted on. <laughs> and you can feel free to blend your answer. Um, the first one is kind of interesting because it borrows from the lecture. So let me just read the three questions and feel free to answer all of them all together or tackle one, but I just wanna acknowledge mm -hmm. these top three. All right, so here we go. The first one. What is in your suitcase, Patricia? That's number one. <laughs> always, then, smart, always smart <laughs> people out there. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, and, and I'll just ask the the next two upvoted ones. Um, thank you so much, Patty, Zachary, and Nathaniel for your questions. Okay, so what's in your suitcase, Patricia? Number two, mm -hmm. are there still any poems you're afraid to write? Parenthesis, recalling one of your workshops from several years ago. And then number three, were you a spoken word poet first and then moved into poems for the page or did you do both forms simultaneously? And if so, what were the changing dynamics that you had to tackle to go to, to make this transition? Okay, uh, I'll go from the bottom back to the suitcase one. Uh, yes, I was a spoken word poet first. Uh, I discovered uh, the Poetry Slam way back in like 19... 87 uh, in Chicago, uh, the, the home of the Poetry Slam. Uh, I, I kind of, I walked in, I, I was invited to this big poetry reading. It was called Neutral Turf. It was meant to put together page poets and, and performance poets. I went, uh, not because I was a poet at the time, because it was in a blues club, five hours over the course of a winter afternoon and there was alcohol. So you'll do anything to get out of the winter in Chicago and drink and laugh at poets, I thought. But when I got there, I didn't laugh. I, you know, I discovered this whole um, literary scene that I didn't know anything about. And Gwendolyn Brooks was there. I mean, it was it was amazing. Uh, and there was a, a, a guy there by the name of Michael War, still one of my best friends, uh, who took me to the Green Mill where the slam is. And so I got started by getting up on stage and doing poetry. Uh, that was my life for a long time. Um, and there was always kind of this, this chasm when people thought, well, you're a performance poet, you are you're you write for the page. And I saw no sense in that being there. And uh, and so I, I had to do a lot of changing of my work when I realized I was going to start concentrating more on poets for publication, only because when you are doing it on stage, there's a lot of throat clearing the people don't have the poem to take home and look over later. So your language has to be very immediate. Uh, and a lot of that stuff, uh, I could just cut right out when I was gonna transfer it to the page. And I, I made it my, um, my goal to learn um, metrics, to learn prosody, uh, to learn form, uh, because that ties them so much together. Because when I revised a poem that I was doing on stage, I was revising into form. I just didn't know there was a name for it. So that was the main thing with that. Uh, and then the 
Oh God, I forgot it already. The other, the 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 middle question. Just give me a two two word hint. Any poems afraid? Uh, no, that's not two words. <laughs> Any poems you're yeah. afraid I got it. to write? Okay, I got it. Um, there were, but there aren't now. There were recently. Uh, uh, as you might imagine, my mother is a very complicated person, a very complicated topic. Someone who had never realized or recognized what I was most passionate about, never saw creative writing or poetry as some way to make a living, never. And now she is uh, in a nursing home in pretty steep cognitive decline. Um, and so writing about my mother and admitting out loud that uh, just because someone gives birth to you doesn't mean that you automatically, uh, un without question, love them. Uh, and that was a hard place to go, especially when you're in rooms with other women. Uh, and, but when I did start to write a couple of those poems and I've started putting them in, in, putting them in readings, um, I've had other women come up to me and say, I feel that way. I just didn't know there was that anyone else was talking about it. So, and that's one of the joys in poetry uh, for anything that's happening that makes you feel like I have to be the only one. I have to be the only one feeling this way or going through this. Uh, that is not true. No matter what the something is, you are not the only one. Uh, and that's really helped me in the writing of those poems. And that was kind of my, that was my last kind of dark horizon in terms of poetry. It was always there. And I didn't know what was going to, uh, when I was going to break into that and start writing. But my mother is, um, as she's 90 now, and I don't know how much longer she'll be here, you know? And, and, and I thought, um, we're charged with the telling of our own life stories. And if we don't do it, we give someone else permission to do it. And we don't ever want to do that. So, um, so, uh, not right now. I can't think of anything that, that I wouldn't write. Um, What's in my suitcase? Hmm. I think uh, I I said early on when I was a kid that I wanted to be a writer, and uh, and I didn't specify, you know, what kind of writer. And my mother said only white men do that. And in her um. Uh, in her experience, that was true. You know, she watched a lot of television when she saw the news or when she saw people commenting on important things or writers of books or things like that. It was it was always someone white. And again, it was her trying to save me uh, from heartbreak. You know, uh, don't do that. And my father, in that wonderful stage whisper that he had developed by that time, would say, you can do anything you want, you know. And so... I think my suitcase that I open occasionally is when my mother's voice starts to take over and uh, comes back to me and says, well, no, you don't really know what you're doing or you're just pretending or you better be nice to those white folks. That's my favorite one. You know, those white folks will take it away from you, you know, whatever it is. Uh, and when I open it, it's everything that I remember about my father. My father's voice is in there, that stupid, that, that stupid Old Spice he used to wear, those hats, those shiny pants he wore all the time. You know, uh, everything's in there. And uh, I've, opened it more, I've opened it more than I thought I would have to. Uh, there's, a, there are, there's always something or someone uh, working to get you to doubt yourself. And uh, if I could have any, any, any wish at all, I would wish my father back for one day so that, um, that he could, could hear, uh, he can hear his daughter as a storyteller. Thank you, Patricia. Um... You're welcome, Nikkei. Uh, is there anything else that you'd like to say to everyone tuning in before I um, bring us home? I, I 
want to once again just thank everyone for coming. It's been an it's been an amazing couple of years for me, um, and I owe it to everyone. You know, everyone who's read a poem, uh, listened, sat in an audience, uh, uh, my students who continue to teach me all the time, the people who populated the chairs at the poetry slams, uh, I would be nowhere near where I am now without them. Um, and just that we're always going to always need each other. And so for as long as uh, all of you, all Oh my God, there can't be that many people here. But uh, as long as as long as long all of you are with me, I'm with you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you all again for attending this year's Blaney Lecture with Patricia Smith, presented by the Academy of American Poets. Our publications and programs, including live events such as this one, are made possible in part thanks to the support of our members many of whom have joined us tonight. Thank you for he being here. To become a member and to learn more about how you can support our free programs, the Champion Poets, and promote the appreciation of poetry, please visit poets.org membership. Thank you again also to Christina Monson and Bernice Williams of Pro Bono ASL for providing ASL interpretation for this lecture. And 